I want to uh, tell you, I want to go ahead and forewarn you. I got a lot to say in a little bit of time. And I have debated whether to try to break this down somewhere, but everything's so important, I won't take anything out. So uh, we're just going for it, which really means you have to listen quickly. And uh, if you didn't listen quickly, I'm just going to take for granted, even though I haven't seen it, that online we've got some notes that go along with this. And if not, I'll give you my sermon. I've, I've got a yes, they're there. So that's good. I'll still keep you in there. But um, I want to start, this is my review of last week, just two verses. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I've got to get me some walking room. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start in verses 9 and 10. And what I want you to see in verses 9 and 10 is how you've been renamed or how you have been labeled of God. And so go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse number 9. You are a chosen generation. You've been chosen by God. Does that make anybody feel good? God has chosen us. Raise your hand if you are glad that you are chosen of God. You are chosen, a chosen generation. You are not only a priesthood. I told you last week you're all called into the priesthood, but you're not only a priesthood, you're a royal priesthood. You get to wear purple. God has made that for every one of you. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. And notice what he says next. You are a holy nation. You've been set apart together as your own nation. It's actually not our own nation. It's his nation. Isn't that wonderful? You are a part of the nation of God. God has given you this banner. If we had flags, we could run around with these things on it. So he tells us, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a peculiar people. Now normally we don't like to be called peculiar, but this is great. God says you are peculiar. You are different. And you know we're all peculiar, aren't we? Each one of us, wonderfully, individually designed of God, peculiar. He tells us all of these things that you should because He has given you these things. He says that you should show forth the praises of Him. Praises to God. Him who hath called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Which in times past we were not a people. We were not a holy nation. We were not a chosen generation. But we have these things now. We're a royal priesthood because God has given that assignment to us. He says, which in times past were not a people, but now are the people of God. You know what? Isn't that how you want to be associated? If you are a child of God, you should say, you know what? I am a child of God. I am a Christian, and I am proud of it. No, I'm not perfect. No, I'm not right all the time, but I am forgiven, and God loves me. I go back to that shirt my mother used to put on me when I was about two or three years old. When I look at it, it says, I know I'm somebody because God don't make no junk. You know, I know some of you have had that shirt before, that very same shirt. I know that saying's been on there. God makes us special, and He's called us for a purpose. And with that thought, I want us to go into the message of today. Today, title of today's sermon, Living in the Power of submission and obedience. Now, we like the word power. We do not like the word submission. And we certainly don't like the word obedience unless we have the power that somebody is being submissive and obedient to us. That's how the world looks at these three words together, right? And we think, oh, if I got that power, you're going to listen to me. We think we are somebody. That's not what the Bible says about these words. And we're at a place in time that truthfully so many in our nation, in the world, is confused about these words. Power, submission, obedience. Let's hear what the Word of God says to us today. Read along with me, if you would, starting in verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I urge you as strangers and pilgrims. Let me stop right there. 
strangers and pilgrims. We don't understand really what that means. We know what the definition means. We know that means I'm not from here. This world is not my own. Yeah, I really don't live here because my eternity is in heaven. I have a residence there. You've heard me recite that to you I don't know how many times, and you got it. But do you really have it? Do you live as a stranger and a pilgrim in this earth? Or do you understand that's the classification, but really most of the time here I'm still living as a citizen of the USA. I'm still living in worldly things instead of understanding I'm to live as a stranger and a pilgrim. It's a faith thing. It's a total redirection of our positioning of where we are. So he says here again, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I urge you, as your faith would lead you, be a stranger and a pilgrim. It says this in the book of Hebrews 11, 3, excuse me, 11, 13. Um, in Hebrews 11, we see the great faith chapter of all the, the people of the Old Testament. We see in this great faith they had. And I want to read something about them to you in Hebrews 11:13. It says this, These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Do you see that? Through their faith, they understood this world was not all there is, and it changed the way they lived to that point. Their faith, they understood. Stranger and pilgrim is not a word, it's not a title. No, it's a new way of life. This world and this world's way of thinking is not all there is for me. I'm to be a stranger and a pilgrim. We look at 1 Peter 1, 17, and it says this, And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. In other words, it's temporary. You are a stranger. You are a pilgrim. This world is not your home. But it's, it's more than understanding that. It is a change of life. My faith says, I will no longer look at things from the world's way. I will look at them from God's way. And we know that that is recorded and given to us in God's Word. You know, we're called to walk in faith. Go with me if you would, real quickly. i got a lot of verses I'm going to throw at you. Romans chapter 13, it says this in verse 14. Romans 13, 14. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith says I'm to be different. Paul is, excuse me, Peter is bringing this up again. Your faith changes your position, the way you look at things. Don't put on the world's way of thinking, but put ye on Jesus Christ. We are to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 tells us, walk ye in the Spirit. That's walk in the Word of God. Walk led by the Holy Spirit, not walk of this world. You've heard that so many times from this pulpit. He goes on in Galatians 5 and 25. He says, hey, if we're of the Spirit, then let us so walk in the Spirit. We're called to walk in the Spirit. Now, go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, second part of the verse. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Here's a word, war. What does that mean to you? That means it's a pretty dirty fight, right? And so he says here, I beseech you in your faith, understand your positioning as strangers and pilgrims, and stay away from the fleshly lust. Stay away from the world. You're stranger and pilgrims. This world is not your own because things of this world war against your very soul. I don't want to lose my soul. Anybody want to lose your soul? Hey, your soul is forever. When God decided to take the earth and form man, it says God in first, excuse me, Genesis chapter, chapter 1, verse 7, it says that God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul, and souls are forever. And as we understand our souls are forever, things of this world, fleshly lust, war against our very souls. I like the way James puts it. If you would, go with me to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, it should just be a page backwards in your Bible. I want to read verses 1 through 3, talking about living in the flesh. 
From whence comes wars and fightings among you. There's that war word again, war. Come they not hence even of your lust that you war in your members. When we're thinking of things earthly, when we have spite and envy and covetousness, those things of, of the world in us, when we have this, they're warring in our own members. Ye lust and ye have not, ye kill and desire to have and you cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because you ask not. Well, wait a minute. Yes, I do. I pray and God doesn't answer me. Listen to verse 3. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. There is a war for the world, a war for our souls from the world. Application number one, moving quickly. The war of the flesh is a spiritual battle that you choose to win by submission to God in obedience to the Word of God. I know that's a lot, so I'm going to say it again. The war of the flesh is a spiritual battle that you choose to win by submission to God, that's our relationship to God, in obedience in the Word of God. And that might sound like a lot, but there's even more in this. I say you choose to win, not by your power, but by God's power. He's given you everything you need to be victorious in that war. That's why it's a spiritual battle. The war of the flesh is a spiritual battle that you choose to win by submission to God in obedience to the Word of God. Look, we were created to be submissive. Nobody wants to hear that, especially in the United States. I will tell you, when I go on mission trips to another country, it... it there's, there's just something about that change when I walk in there and I realize, even though I'm not trying to be, that we are automatically prideful people. Everybody I come in contact with is so humble. And I get this reset. And then when I come back home 10 days later or two weeks later, I'm mad at everybody in the United States for the first week. I'm just ill because we are so wanting and prideful in this country. We don't even realize where we are. I'm telling you, it's a fact. We, we're just accustomed to things. And that's not how God has called us to live. So I want you to understand, God created you and me to be submissive. He created you to be in a position of submissiveness. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture. And some of you aren't going to like it. And I'm just going to say, you can't handle the truth. But the truth of God's Word is what it is. And if we are going to live this life the way God has intended for us to live, we have to live by God's Word. And so we go on. We're created to be submissive. Here's what I mean. You either are submissive to the devil, the evil one, the prince of this world, or you choose by God's grace to be submissive to God. There is no in-between. There is nothing else. See, you're created to be submissive. You will be submissive. Some say, I'm not submissive to anybody. You're already submissive to the devil, and you don't even realize it. You are created to be submissive. And you are either submissive to the evil one, the prince of this world, or by God's grace and the leading of His Holy Spirit, you have chosen to be submissive to God. Go with me to Romans chapter 6. Some of y'all say, he's done going to preaching now. Let's go. Romans 6. I'm not going to read verses 1 through 5, although extreme importance. It talks, it's some really good stuff. Paul's making an argument about God's grace, and he goes into to understanding those of us who've been baptized. We've been baptized into Jesus' death. But go with me starting at verse 5. I'm going to bring some words out. In verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, speaking of baptism, speaking of our new life, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth we should not, what's that word? Serve sin. So we got serve here. 
Well, serve means there's somebody to serve. That means we're under someone, right? And so the starting point is this. We've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We've been baptized into the family. There's a change that's supposed to happen. We are no longer supposed to serve the devil. We are supposed to serve God. Who is it that you are submissive to? Notice as we go further. He says in verse 7, For he that is dead is, what's that word? Freed. You see, you were in bondage. You were under submissiveness. You've been freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death have no more dominion, no more power, no more structure over Him. For in that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord." Let not sin therefore, what's that word? Reign. Do you see? You are submissive. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. If you don't believe in God, you are submissive to the devil. He's got you around his finger. If you are a believer of God, but you're still living in the world, and these words are coming in, these power words, understand that you are following, you're being submissive to the evil one. Let's go further. There's so much of this scripture that I could get into, and I just don't have time. Verse 13, neither yield, you see that relationship again? Yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but instead yield, be submissive, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law. But you're what? Under grace. Do you see our submissive position? So he goes on, what then? Verse 15, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, whether it is sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? You get to choose. Am I going to be submissive to the evil one? Or am I going to be submissive to God? Who will you choose to obey? Who will you choose to submit to? There is no biblical example of anything in between. All kinds of opinions. We can call up Dr. Phil and Oprah and Donahue and whoever else that might still be around. I don't know. But let me just say this. Scripturally speaking, the truth of God's Word you are submissive to the devil or you are submissive to God. There is no other place. Application number two. Christians are called to live in submission. And besides submission, I want you to write this. Relationship. Christians are called to live in submission, a relationship and obedience Obedience is action to God in all we do. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, Christians are called to live in submission. That's our relationship with God and obedience. That's the action. That's us actually putting it in work to God in all that we do. Go with me, verse 12, back in 1 Peter. At this rate, we might make it by 2. Verse 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submission to God is practiced through our obedience to God's Word everywhere and in front of all people. It's not hidden somewhere. We don't decide to be obedient here and not obedient there. No, submission, our relationship with God, is practiced through our obedience to His Word. God's Word instructs us how we should walk or how we should live. Would you agree with that? The answer is yes. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 17. If you would go with me, Romans 12, verse 17 and 18. This whole chapter again is a power chapter in Scripture. But Romans chapter 12 starting at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize... That's a wrong verse. Hang on just a second. That's 1 Corinthians. That would cause some questions. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. Well, I'll get it right. Hey, just chill out. I'm not perfect. All right. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 verse 17. All right, here we go. Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We are to live how? Peaceably with all men. Go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 again. Have in your conversation, your actions in front of others, honest among the Gentiles, the non-believers, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers because of your faith, you live in such a way that your good works, which they shall behold, will bring glory to God in the day of visitation. It's how we are to live in front of others. I think a better text for us to look at is in the book of Philippians. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians 2, verse 13 through 15, it says this, For it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do His good pleasure, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. I just thought a little emphasis was needed there. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Do you see how God has called you to operate? It's not to be the one on top. He's called you to live in whatever place that He has designed for you to be, being submissive in a relationship with Him and obedience to His Word. And that even when you're in the midst of unbelievers, you don't judge them for their unbelief, but no, you live in a way that shines like lights to them, that brings them to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christians are called through their submission, voluntary position. You've put yourself there. Christians are called through their submission, your voluntary position to God to be obedient to those in authority. What does that mean? Let's spend a little time. Go back with me. We spent a lot of time in Romans. That's a good book. Let's see what Paul says. Think about it. Paul's writing his letter under Roman control that nobody liked the Romans. But let's see what he says. Go with me to the book of Romans. In the book of Romans chapter 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. Paul says this, Let every soul be subject, submission, unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Why would I submit to people who are in authority? Well, first of all, it's appointed by God. Go back with me if you would. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's read verses 13 through 15. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Preacher, you done gone to meddling. What does the Word of God say? It says, submit, be obedient to those 
that are in authority. And we see all of these authority figures. We see government that is listed. Why would I be submissive to government? First of all, in verse 14 it says, they're appointed by God. You might say, well, I don't see how this person is appointed or that person's appointed. We can see that all through history. God has used ungodly kings and godly kings to do His bidding. God is in control of all things, whether you think so or not. Why would I submit or obey people in authority? In verse 14 it says, because they've been appointed by God. Notice the purpose in verse 14, to punish rule breakers and promote those that do well. What's God, or what's the, what's the Apostle Peter calling us to do? It is to do well. In verse 15, it's God's will that we submit. Now, before you turn the TV off or before you run out of here, listen to it all. Understand, God has called us to submit to authority. I don't know if I can do that. Does that ring a bell in anybody's mind? I just don't know. Go back to Romans 13, 14. Make no provision for the flesh, but put ye on Jesus Christ. Quite frankly, it's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about the Heavenly Father that has created us and put us here for a purpose. And we don't want to hear it, but that is the truth. It's not about us. Let's go even further in understanding because God's Word is, is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, right? He gives us all the instruction we need for every situation. I know there's questions coming. You just want to fire them off at me. Just wait. Listen. If we go to the book of Titus, chapter 3, the book of Titus, just before Timothy. Well, just after Timothy, actually. Somewhere in there. Titus, chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, but I am going to tell you all of that chapter is good. Read it all. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life this is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works these things are good and profitable to all men. You might be saying, I just don't understand why God would do that. God's ways are not our ways. God has His plan. And in God's plan, you are the light to the lost. And not just when they behave well, when they're lost. We are the light to the lost. It's just how God has called it. And God knows best. We obviously don't know best. How many times have we failed and failed miserably? God's plan is perfect. It's God's design. Why else would I submit to people in authority? It is just God's design. Go with me. 1 Corinthians. I can already tell I'm going to have to give half and we're going to have to come back for more. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with me in verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 27. I'm sorry, I keep going back to that verse. Verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound things which are mighty. 
and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Why? He gives us an example here. That no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. We are to be submissive because it is the only way we will bring total honor and glory to Jesus Christ. You know, you might ask the question, why in the world would I be submissive to some of these people? Well, in the world, you might not have a good reason, but you are not in the world. You are strangers and pilgrims. Our faith resets our position. Don't be submissive to the enemy. Be submissive to God. Let me just throw some things out here. I remember, y'all stay with me. I remember about five years ago, Oh, if this person gets elected, uh, I, I, I'm just going to move somewhere else. If this person gets elected, I'm going to move somewhere else. Every, both sides, I don't care which side you're on. It could be one of the ten candidates out there. Somebody else gets elected, I'm leaving. And then an election took place, and I remember hearing this statement. Well, that ain't my president. He ain't going to be my president. You know what's changed four years later? Nothing. Four years later, we have different positions. We have, a, we have a different president in place. I mean, no value. I'm not demeaning anything from the leadership, but people haven't changed. Just different groups are saying the same thing now. Well, this isn't my president. She's not going to be my congressman. And you know where we carry that to? We, we carry it to, well, that, that teacher, I'm not going to listen to that teacher. You know, your, your kids pick up on, I'm not listening to that teacher. You know why your kids won't listen to the teacher? Because they've heard the parents say, I'm not going to listen to that teacher. That teacher doesn't know what she's talking about. We have not taught obedience to our children at a time that is greatly important for them to understand submission to God and obedience to what God has called. And then we wonder why they respect no one when they grow older in life unless the grace of God comes upon them. We are taught from the very beginning that we should be submissive to God and in that, that we are to obey those in authority. And so when we ask the question, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to what this teacher says. You know where that goes further? I'm not going to listen to what my parents says. They don't know what they're talking about. We live in a day that people can divorce their parents. What kind of wickedness is that? It's what happens when we are submissive to the prince of this world instead of submissive in a relationship with God that leads to obeying His Word. Application number three. If you... It's actually application number four. If you're not submitting to those in authority then you're not walking in submission. Properly position of the heart with God. I'll say that again. If you're not submitting to those in authority wherever, then you're not walking in submission. Properly position heart condition to God. You're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. Now in time, I've got to bring this up. Wait a minute, Pastor. What if they're not godly people? We don't know anybody's heart. Wait a minute, Pastor. What if they're not exhibiting godly fruit? Who are we to judge? Not sub submitting because someone is an ungodly person. That's not mentioned in Scripture. But I'll tell you what is mentioned. When anyone of authority demands, rules, tells you, you must do something in defiance of God's Word. That is the time, Christians, that we draw a line in the sand. It's just that simple. But just because someone is ungodly, if they're not commanding you to be ungodly, guess what? 
we should still be submitting. We should be obeying. If, if you just worry about something with someone, but they're not directing you, that's why you need to know the Word of God, so you know what's right and what's wrong. But the second they say, you must do something against God's Word, never, ever, ever does the Word of God ask you or give you permission or give us direction to go against God's Word. Never. Let me give you some examples of this. I'm going to be fast because I'm out of time. So much I want to say. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. There's two Hebrew midwives that have been told they should kill any Jewish male, any Jewish babies. And it says in Scripture that they fear God and they don't. Right? It goes against God's Word. In Joshua chapter 2, we see Rahab disobeyed a command from the king of Jericho to produce the Israelite spies. What did she do? She let them out the back, right? She went against it because she feared the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we have Obadiah who feared the Lord greatly and with king, uh, Queen Jezebel was killing out all of God's prophets. He hid 100 of God's prophets. He went against the king at the time because he feared the Lord. More famous to us, we could get into Daniel chapter 3 where we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Pastor Bill talked about this Wednesday night. They refused to bow down to the golden idol in a disobedience to the king. And they said, hey, you know, I'm not going to fear you. I'm going to fear the Lord. We could continue in, in the book of Daniel chapter 6. We see Daniel himself defied the king's decree by not praying uh, to the king, but praying to God. Why? Because of his relationship and his fear to the Lord. Each one of these examples, they were asked to do something contrary to God's word. And they said, I just can't do that. There is a time of defiance. That time of defiance is when you've been ordered when you've been directed to go against God's Word. And it's never okay. It's never okay. So much of this subject I'd like to talk about. Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. We see Peter and John are arrested and they're told not to speak of the name of Jesus again. And they said, we got to. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, they say, who are we going to fear? Are we going to fear you with some beating and clubs or are we going to fear God? You see, we see these examples. Does that mean we're not called to action? Does that mean that, that, that we shouldn't exercise our voice? No, but we should do it peacefully. There are ways to do things. You as a citizen of this country, because of the laws that are given to you, you have a right to vote. You have a right to lead. And you should be motivated to do your right that has been given to you. But do it peacefully. Stop judging everybody else. God is in charge of putting people in and taking people out. We do our part we do it in peace. And we do it in such a way that we shine like lights to the glory of God. I'm going to have to end with this. So much I want to say. There's, there's a greater reason that we submit and obey. The examples given later in this chapter and what Jesus did. I'm not going to go there. I'm saving that for next week. But you've got to come back. It's just too important. But if you would, go with me. I just want to talk about submission and obedience for a second. I want it clearly understood. Go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Let's listen to the prophet. He's talking about those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Start reading with me in verse 11. Before I read this, I just want you to understand. I don't want you to get confused. Submission, voluntarily placing yourself under God. Submission, a heart relationship with God to the point that I trust what God says over what I say. Submission. And from that comes obedience, obeying the Word of God, the action that goes along with it. Understand this, you can be obedient without submission. 
You can be obedient without a heart of submission, but it's fruitless and useless in every way. Go with me now, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, God speaking? Saith the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks and of lambs and of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. What is being said here is all the religious things to bring honor and sacrifice to God. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, These are meaningless to me because you're doing acts of obedience without any heart relation of submission. He goes on in verse 14, Your new moons have a, your appointed feast my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Did you get that? When you pray to me, I will not answer your prayers. He says, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge, that's provide for the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together. This let us reason together is come let us be in a relationship. Understand the relationship that I've designed for you. Let us submit ourselves to God. He says, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? When we come with the right heart, even though our sins may be as red as scarlet, He will make them white as snow. Though they be crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye will be willing and obedient Ye shall eat the good of the land. That's a promise of Scripture. But in this same Scripture, he says in verse 20, But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. You get a choice. Not actions, not obedience alone. But you get a choice to stay submitted to the devil submittive to the evil one, submittive to the prince of this world in doing things your own way. Or by God's grace, you get to decide to voluntarily position yourself under God, giving Him all authority of your life. To receive from Him His Holy Spirit and His Word to guide you in every way. Your heart motive is a submissiveness to God which automatically in that heart motive produces an obedience to God's Word. You know there's a promise there. When we look at verse 19 when that happens, the promise is, I will give you all the protection you need. I will give you all the provision you need. All the promises of God will be yours. The very presence of God will be inside of you. In all I do, I will have God with me. Isn't that what we want to live? Don't we want to have God a part of our life every day and all we're doing? And we're still hung up on, I can't submit to authority because I don't like them. Listen, you're missing the big picture. Be submissive to God. Have your heart relationship with God and be obedient to what He's called you to do. And do that. You will fulfill the purpose that He has given you. You will bring the lost to salvation through your actions. All by the power of God and His Holy Spirit. You will never lack. You will have the provision. You will have the protection. You will have everything that God has promised for you. That's what Scripture says. God is not a liar. He tells the truth. His Word is the same and stands forever. Tonight, we're going to go further, just in our roundtable, about this obeying authority. What's right, what's wrong, what should we expect 
What's the right things to do? What's the wrong things to do? We're taking no political side. I want you to understand that. If you come with a political position, I don't want to hear it. I want to preach to you the Word of God. And we apply it equally. We all have them. I've got an opinion. You've got an opinion. And I'm going to love you for yours and you can love me for mine. But what matters is the Word of God in us living in accordance of the Word of God with a submissive heart to Him. My heart's connected to Him. I trust in Him. Because I trust Him, I will obey. Praise team as you come forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for this time we get in Your Word. And God, I just ask You now, God, may this Word, may it just be, be where we can meditate on it. May something of this Word strike us in such a way, God, that, that we would study it. We wouldn't just chew on it. We wouldn't have an opinion. No, God, we would seek Your opinion in the midst of it all. And God, would You allow Your Holy Spirit to bring truth, truth, God, let us just see your truth. And God, if our hearts are hard, would you soften them? God, if we're living in the right place, would you just encourage us? And God, if we are not living submitted to you in that right voluntary position of our heart given to you, you in control of our lives, God, would you just work with us now? God, as we sing this song, if there is one or many that are not where they should be with you, let alone others, God, right now, would they just ask for your forgiveness and ask you to come into their lives? Would you take reign of their lives? May we be your servants who show our submission, our heart, our love through obeying your word. You are all the power. You are where lives can be changed. God, may we just come to you now as we sing, would hearts be moved in Jesus' name.